it's the right order. Pose? Do, do you want to say her? No, she's not here. Good morning, I'm Council Member Ku, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. We are joined by Council Members Palmer, Barron, and Wills. Today, we will be hearing on and voting on two items. First is LU831, the designation by LPC of the Salvation Army National and Territorial Headquarters, located at 120-130 West 14th Street as an exterior landmark. Built from 1923 to 1935, this building has served as the headquarters of the Salvation Army for more than 80 years and continues to serve the needs of this important organization. The building is in Council Member Johnson's district and he supports the designation. We have Kay Lemos uh, Mahel from LPC. Uh, she's going to testify with, uh, together with your associate, right? Yeah. So please identify yourself and start. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman Ku and Council members. Um, I am Kate Lemos McHale from the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I'm here with Ali Rasulinajad. Um, and I will take you through a brief presentation about this designation. The Salvation Army National and Territorial Headquarters on 14th Street was designated by the Landmarks Commission on October 17th of this year. It was designed by Ralph Walker and constructed in 1929 to 35 to serve as the headquarters for the American operations of the Salvation Army, an international religious and charitable organization started in England in 1865 and currently serving in 127 countries with a central philosophy of bringing assistance to those in needs and providing a range of health and human services. The complex is significant, significant for its association with the Salvation Army and as a dramatic and functional design by one of the preeminent skyscraper architects of the 20th century. The proposed designation was heard at public hearings in 1982, 1990, and most recently on February 11th, 2014. At that time, the commission received support for designation from the Historic Districts Council, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, and State Senator Brad Hoyleman. Um, recently, we have also received support from Council Member Corey Johnson, the owners who um, historically had opposed designation, um, no longer opposed designation. We were able to work with them to create a designation that they were comfortable with. Uh, the Salvation Army complex consists of an 11-story office structure with a one-story tower, an adjacent four-story auditorium structure, both facing 14th Street, and a 17-story dormitory originally built for working women facing 13th Street. The 13th Street building, which you can see in the background of this historic photo and also on the map that's dashed in, uh, was included in the Greenwich Village Historic District and is not included in this designation. So this designation focuses on those buildings facing 14th Street. Founded in England in 1865 by William and Catherine Booth, the Salvation Army began outreach in New York in 1880, and its work expanded rapidly here and in other US cities. In 1895, the organization erected a national headquarters building on 14th Street, and by 1920s, a larger facility re was required to serve a wider variety of purposes. At this time, uh, the Salvation Army had won popular acclaim and recognition for its work on the frontiers in France in support of American troops during World War I and for social service work in the United States that made it one of the nation's most respected charities. The Salvation Army commissioned the, form, the firm of Voorhees, Gamellan, and Walker to design a new headquarters complex on its existing site. The Salvation Army was, quote, deeply concerned with creating a new symbol of its positive impact on the city while minimizing its costs, unquote. The new headquarters complex was dedicated in May 1930 as the centerpiece of uh, the Salvation Army's Golden Jubilee National Congress, 
in celebration of 50 years of work in the United States. Ralph Walker was a master designer of Art Deco sk skyscrapers known for such landmarks as the Barclay Vesey Building, the Western Union Building at 60 Hudson Street, and the Irving Trust Bank at 1 Wall Street. For the Salvation Army headquarters, Walker eliminated conventional ornament and used the building materials of brick and cast stone as a an asymmetrical massing to create a dramatic and functional design, specifically related to the activities and limited budget of the Salvation Army. At the dedication of the complex, the Salvation Army expressed its appreciation for Walker's strikingly modernistic, chaste, and restrained buildings, with their workmanlike details and lack of superfluous ornament that so befit the ideals and organization they house. The entrance to the auditorium, a large public gathering space that is critical to the work of the Salvation Army, beckons with a generous and deep opening that appears to be edged with curtains, a proscenium opening on a stage. The office structure, on the other hand, is almost entirely functional and less ornate than Walker's other commercial buildings. It features an understated decorative motif and a spare yet sculptural treatment of the masonry, with its height, height emphasized by layered vertical brick bands between the bays, and its ornament limited to shallow cast stone reliefs at the top of its lower floors. This purpose-built ensemble has been used by the Salvation Army for more than 80 years. Limited alterations over the years include the reconstruction of the tower at the east side of the 14th Street facade, the addition of signage, and the replacement of original 3 over 3 windows by 1 over 1 sash, a configuration that is consistent with the Art Deco style. The designation report recognizes the significance of the organization, the significance of the architecture and its purpose-built nature, and the importance of the Salvation Army's continued use of its historic 14th Street headquarters, which may need to continue to adapt such things as signage to fulfill its mission. Thank you. Any members of our committee have questions? So, um, are there any oppositions to the landmarking process? No. No? At the time of designation, there was no opposition. The neighborhood merchants, the pe people live around there, they all like the, mm -hmm. the landmarking status. For yeah, we didn't hear from direct neighbors, but we heard from the Greenwich Village Society and sort of groups, you know, similar to that. Okay, do you have any more questions? Yeah. Council Member Rose? I'm sorry, I, I was here, and I was paying attention a little, <laughs> mostly. Um, I, um, are you just asking for a landmark designation, or is there going to be some work done to this building also? Just approval of the, com the Landmark Commission's designation. Okay. Sorry, Thank that you. wasn't clear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, seeing no questions, uh, you, you can uh, step down. Thank you very much. Are there any mon uh, members of the public who would want to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on LU831. Next, we will hold a public hearing on LU512, the application for approval of a 99-year sublease by the Health and Hospital Corporation for property located at 82-61 Parsons Boulevard. Approval of the lease uh, will allow for the development of 206 units of housing, including, including 75 units of supported housing. The development will also contain 12,000 square feet of long residential space to be used by HHC and 8,000 square feet of community facility space. This property is in Council Member Lansman's district. And today we have Christo uh, Christopher Walker and John Janko from uh, New York City Health Plus Hospitals to testify. Thank you. 
You can identify yourself and stop, yeah. Good morning, uh, Chairman Ku, members of the committee. My name is John Jorenko. I'm Vice President for Government Community Relations and Planning uh, at the New York City Health and Hospital, or at uh, NYC Health and Hospitals. I'm joined this morning by Christopher Roker, who is the CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals, Queens. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of a proposed lease agreement between New York City Health and Hospitals and Dunn Development Corp for an approximately 167,000 square foot parcel of land located on the campus of New York City Health and Hospitals, Queens, that includes the existing T building. Um, as some of you may know, New York City Health and Hospitals has engaged in several collaborations with housing providers and developers to create affordable, supportive, and sustainable housing on parcels, parcels of land that are no longer needed for healthcare services. This proposed lease would allow for the renovation of the T building to create approximately 206 units of housing among other uses. Approximately 131 of the 206 units will consist of a mix of studio and one, two, and three bedroom units for low to moderate middle income New Yorkers and one unit for live-in superintendent. Of these, 75 units will be for those up to 60% of the area median income and 51 units will be for those up to 100% of the AMI. The balance of the remaining units, 75, will be supportive housing for low-income individuals who are appropriate for independent living in the community and whose incomes are less than 60% of the AMI. CAMBA will provide a complement of on-site social services for these residents as well as front desk attendance services for the building. Apart from the housing, 12,000 square feet of space will be renovated for use by uh, New York City Health and Hospitals Queens for non-direct medical care uses at no charge other than for utilities and maintenance. In addition, 8,000 square feet of space will be provided for a community facility use at no charge except that the tenant is responsible for utilities, repairs, and general operating expenses. Financing will be provided by using a combination of sources, including a first mortgage associated with private activity tax-exempt bonds through HDC, a second mortgage from New York City uh, Housing Development Corporation, a third mortgage from New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, and low-income housing tax credit equity will be used as both construction and permanent financing with a substantial portion bridged by the tax-exempt bonds and HDC second mortgage financing during construction. New York City Health and Hospitals Board of Directors conducted a public hearing in Queens on September, 20, or September 7th, 2016 with respect to the proposed leasing. HHC's Board of Directors subsequently authorized the leasing of the property on September 22nd, uh, 2016. Thank you for your consideration of this proposed lease. I can now answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yeah. So can you tell uh, our committee what's 60% AMI, what's uh, uh, an average when 60% AMI and 100% AMI in the area? Or let's say a typical uh, one bedroom or two bedroom apartment? Certainly, Chairman. Uh, so for a studio, 60% uh, of the AMI, the monthly rent as of right now would be $761. Uh, the income band is between 27977 up to a maximum of $40,080. Uh, one bedroom, 60% AMI, monthly rent would be $963. So the minimum in the income band would be $34,971, a maximum of $45,840. Um, I, I do have a table that I could submit to the committee if you would okay, like. Okay, sure. Um, who is doing the management of this building? Uh, Dunn Development Corporation will mm. be the developer and the, the, uh, management, the management and CAMBA, uh, which is an established uh, social services provider and housing provider in Brooklyn, will provide on-site social services and front desk duty. So uh, besides uh, the living units, are there any commercial units in this building? No, there will be no commercial units, but we will have um, space for use by Queens Hospital Center, and also uh, we will have community space that we're negotiating right now with a community provider. One of the things that we heard in our discussions with the community was the importance of having um, space for the community to use and some services that uh, give back to the community. So that's what we're trying to achieve 
um, and that would be rent free, but they're responsible for utilities and maintaining the operation. Um, Mr. Roker, is there anything you would like to add? Yeah, so, so the, the community, this is gonna be great for the community, for the hospital, outpatient, inpatient, for those patients that need to transition as well. So we are in full support of this. Uh, we are also joined by Council Member Kalos. Yeah. Oh, I, I put it here. So, and I could say. Uh, any more members want questions? Uh, Council Member Bowie? Oh, Council Member. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, you talked about the AMI for the units that will be developed. What is the community's AMI in this area where this development is going up? Uh, that would be what the community's AMI is. Uh, no, no, no. City, city wide, I'm sorry. I, right. What is the community's AMI? What is the AMI in this community where this housing is going up? Because we talk about building units at 100% of the AMI, and that doesn't match the percentage of people living in that community who have an income of 100%. So I want to know what's the match between what you're proposing and what already the community uh, exists, that's exists there are paid. So I, I have the median income for renter households in community board eight mm -hmm. is $44,886, and this is based on 2012 census data. So the median is 44,000? Correct. Okay, but yet and still you're proposing quite a number of units at 100% of the AMI, which I'm always looking at gentrification, and when what's coming in does not match what currently exists, we're putting the camel's nose into the community and bringing in a level of gentrification, so that's what I'm always concerned about. And of the units that are supportive units, do you have a designation as to um, are these SMIs, are they people, what, what is the body of people that these units are supportive? Sure, if I can address your, your first point, Thank you. um, um, Council Member. The range for the AMI on this project, we heard specifically from the community that they wanted a higher uh, AMI for this, so it was raised uh, accordingly based on what the uh, feedback that we got from the community. And um, to your second point, for the 75 studio units, these would be uh, for persons who um, require services but can live independently in the community with on-site services. And our preference would be for patients that are currently, uh, that utilize Queens Hospital Center uh, for their, whether they are uh, an inpatient or require, uh, or, or are, are there for outpatient services that are unstably housed, we will try to match them to the units at the time that we do rent up uh, and support. These, uh, these are folks, uh, as you know, in New York State, there has been a long, um, there's a court order on this that people should be in the least restrictive right. setting. On, uh, so we don't want people to be uh, unnecessarily in an inpatient bed or in a long-term care facility, but they would be appropriate for supportive housing with appropriate supports and, and social services and then um, medical care, uh, including behavioral health that would be provided uh, diagonal from this building at Queens Hospital Center. So are there people who are classified as SM1 or 2? Or do you know what the classification um, is for the people who are I, I don't know. We, this, this would be something that we look at, you know, two, two and a half years down the road when we actually go to rent up on the space. And uh, lastly, what is the size of the studio apartments that you're renting? How many square feet? Um, can, I'm joined this morning by Jordan Press from HPD. Good morning. Um, the studio, so first of all, uh, to keep in mind that we are fitting the units into the existing building. This is a, a new construction project. Um, the units will match, H, uh, be within HPD's design guidelines. My understanding from the developer is they're approximately 400 square feet. Um, there are none under 350 square feet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Council Palmer, uh, uh, Palmer? I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more, Mr. Volk, about this, the space that the medical, the health 
facility is going to be using? Because yeah. here in the testimony it says for non-direct medical care. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be a back office function, back office function, uh, finance, uh, some of our, uh, our accounts payable uh, people, non-direct, nothing to do with the patients. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, on the space used by the hospital, uh, are you paying the rent to, to, the, to the developer? Uh, no, we would not be paying rent. We would be responsible for maintaining the space, utilities, um, uh, general upkeep. So, so the developer, they, they can sustain a profitability on, on, on just collecting rents from the, from the units? Yes. Uh, council member Rose? Um, on, on the space for the community facility that's um, going to be used at no charge, um, is, that, is that a medical um, community facility? Is it recreational? Is it for the residents in the building? What type of community it it would be facility? Non, it would be non-medical, and we're in discussions with a community-based organization uh, to identify what services that they would put in, but it would be non-medical, non-medical services. Uh. Are there any recreational facilities in this building? Not, not that we're aware of. No. Um, and uh, this is one building that's a part of a site. Right. Yeah, yeah. There are other um, buildings on yeah, the so site. Yes, it sits on a 22-acre uh, piece of property. We have about uh, another seven uh, seven buildings on the property. And um, are are they like closely in, in close proximity? Close proximity. Uh, so it would, I would probably say about seven hundred to a thousand feet um, from the T building. So um, is the there's actually a functional hospital on these on oh, the yes. grounds, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, is is that uh, very close to this residential facility? So uh, our portion of the building, the hospital building, sits on Gothels Avenue, and then two blocks away, which is still on the premises, but on Parsons, that's where the building, the T building, lies. I just want to say um, I'm a visual um, learner. I so wish you had um, some Yeah, so think about a football field long. Mm -hmm. That's how far away our building versus the T building. Um, and is there parking provided? Is there parking yes, available yes. for this? Yeah, there'd be approximately 103 uh, parking spaces. Right, for 206 units. Right. Right. Correct. Okay. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Council Member Barron, you have follow-up questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what are the terms of the lease? Uh, dollars. Uh, there is no, there are no terms for dollars. The, uh, the in, in lieu of rent that would accrue to health and hospitals, we get the 12,000 square feet of space outfitted for us. Uh, the this is a there's a substantial cost for us to maintain this building it's an old uh, tuberculosis hospital that dates from the 30s i believe so the in lieu of rent and the annual upkeep and operating costs we would have the space uh, provided to us that sounds like a sweet deal uh, for the, the developer support, uh, well we we believe it's in the best interest of health and hospitals the for these projects that we've done with the council, they typically don't generate a lot of rent. Uh, the last one that we did that we were here um, at, on the campus of Woodhall, the rent is about $89,000. <coughs> so for our purposes, we have about two and a half million in operating costs to maintain this building per year. Two and a half million? Yeah, two and a half million that we will not have uh, once it's developed. And how much is this going to generate for the developer once it's completed and he's collecting rents? Uh, I don't have the financials on the developer's uh, portion of it with me. You know, I think that we need to have all of that kind of information. We look at what happened with, you know, some of the stadiums that were built. And I think that we need to make sure 
that as we make these long-term leases with developers who reap large profits or profits that we don't even know, we don't even have an estimate of how much it's going to be, I think we need to consider that as we make these deals so we don't wind up coming out on the short end of the stick all the time. Uh, my apologies, I don't have that with me, but it would be within HPD's guidelines for what is uh, allowable under their programs. Which I still say is often a sweetheart deal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, one other question. So you only have rents at 60% and at 100%. There's no other bands that, are, um, that you're including. There are none at 80, there are none at... 40, obviously they're not at 40. It would be between 60 and 100%. Uh, and and I, if I can just get clarification. Uh. Yes, because it says here for 60% AMI and 100% AMI. So I'm taking that to mean there are only two distinct bands, those at 60 and those at 100. So the band, it's set at 80%. Um, and actually, Mark, Mark, why don't you just. Uh, I'm Mark, sure. I'm Mark Zimmon. I'm the director of development for Dunn Development Corp. So the, the rental ban for those moderate income units is the rents are set at 80% of AMIs. So they're affordable to households at 80 up to 100%. So you can see from the chart in front of you that it's a pretty wide band of incomes that would be eligible for those units. Right, but we have found. Oh, Sorry. I don't know if this is a question for you. We have found that when developers have the opportunity to uh, say that rents are at 100% of the AMI, they tend to cluster at people who make 100%. We don't find that there's a distribution for people who are at 90, people who are 80, people who are at 70. So there's no provision that I can see in this setup, in this arrangement. So um, I guess my response to that would be that we this will be leased up through an HPD lottery, as is the case with all of the programs that we, we go through HPD funding programs. So the applicants who qualify, whether they be at 80% or 90% or 100%, it'll be in the order of the lottery. So someone who's coming in anywhere within that income band should have an equal opportunity to, uh, to lease that unit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are also joined by the, our chair of the Land Use Committee, uh, Mr. Greenfield. Uh, and Councilmember Kalos, your questions? Sure. Um, forgive me if this has already been asked. How much is H plus H making uh, by converting this space from treatment space uh, to residential space? And how much would you be making if you continue to use it for treatment? I, I, I believe hospital beds are more. Uh, expensive and generate more revenue than uh, there, there are no so, um, yeah so, so right now there are no beds that we're using in the T building uh, actually we have about 37 people staff that are over there for our act program but patients are not being seen over there it's just staff uh, so we're not making any money over there uh, actually it costs us about two million dollars to uh, the upkeep of the building Does, do your occupancy rates track the same as private hospitals? Uh, our occupancy rate for Queens, it's a 253-bed hospital and on Gothels, not the T building, on Gothels, and we're tracking at 79%. And what is the private sector comparison? Uh, 85%. So right now, if I wanted to go to a hospital in my district, one of the private institutions, not mm -hmm. Kohler, if I wanted to schedule a medical procedure, I would have to schedule it for two or three months <laughs> from today because they are that full. Mm. So if I went to H plus H and I needed a medical procedure, how mm -hmm. quickly could I get it? Or is there the similar wait? Uh, depending on what procedure that you're going for. If it's an endoscopy, then I can probably see you in a week. Okay. The, the, uh, if, if I can add, the yeah. utilization rates vary among hospitals uh, within the five boroughs, and also it's seasonal. So it goes up and goes down 
depending on that. The services, uh, the wait times for services also vary among our facilities and then among uh, voluntary hospitals in New York City as well. So there's no, um, it really depends on staffing and what the hours are, but we strive to make, you know, we have night and weekend hours and we strive to make uh, our appointments as open and, and accessible for individuals as they can be. So how much are you making by uh, allowing a developer to use your space for residential housing? So we, there is not a dollar that's associated with this in terms of rent that would come to us. This is cost avoidance. If it costs us between two and two and a half million per year to maintain and keep this building up, the, we will not have that cost. And we are also getting the uh, 12,000 square foot of space that we would not have to rent uh, on the market somewhere else. And how many, when you were using it, how many patients were occupying that space? Oh, this, this site has been not in use as a hospital for many, many years. And, and um, if I may, uh, Chairman Ku used to be on the, ca the Community Advisory Board for Queens Hospital. And 14 or 15 years ago, there was discussion about using, uh, converting this space then. So it's, it's, it's an old- 20 years. Almost 20 years. So, so I guess my, my broader questions are more just about management because I, I have Kohler in my district where you have similarly vacated spaces, mm -hmm. reduced staffing, uh, increased the doctor to patient ratios, and my concern is that the management that you're engaged in is forcing folks away from the public hospital systems towards the private hospital system when I believe that H plus H can compete. And uh, I, I also believe you can compete against the medical tourism that we're starting to see from our city where folks are flying to other countries when they could be getting that same care. And in fact, I believe better care because I take pride in my institutions mm -hmm. uh, here. So I, I guess um, I, 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 I defer to the member in whose district this is, and if that's Peter, then I, I, I defer. But I guess these questions I'm asking is around, is there a plan to just shut down H plus H and turn it into affordable housing? Or no. No. And how are you, and, and the mayor is currently taking away playgrounds in my district to build 50-50 housing without enough money to actually bail out NYCHA, but understandably to bail it out. So I guess I'm just trying to look for some consistency from the administration. So, um, Councilmember Kalos, I'd be more than happy to come and sit with you in your office here at 250 or in your, your district office to talk about larger issues with health and hospitals um, at any time. Okay, so I guess if I am supporting this in, in Peter's district, oh. is it, whose, whose district is it in? Yeah. So uh, which district Council member is Council Member, no. Council member Lansman district? And right. this has Roar, uh, Council yeah. Member Lansman's uh, support? Yes. Okay, and so are you planning to convert my, my hospital into luxury or? Uh, no, council member. So and, my, and again, my hospital is fine, Kohler will be fine. Kohler is a long-term care facility that has 700, uh, more than 700 patients right there. And, and are you going to reopen the spaces that you've been closing and rehire the people who have been laid off? Uh, I'm not familiar with closing spaces at Kohler and rehiring staff. They're We've made staff, uh, we've had managerial reductions uh, at health and hospitals. We've had two rounds of those this past year, but. You're laying off doctors at the same time as you're hiring them, you're leaving entire wings of hospitals vacant, and then after 20 years of leaving it vacant, saying, oh, we should give it to a developer. And so like, I want affordable housing, don't get me wrong, but I just, I would like a public hospital system that has enough beds, enough space, and is competing with uh, other hospitals in my district. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this project has no opposition from community board and also has a approval from local council member Lansman. Yeah, right? council member Lansman is supportive okay. of this. So and we are also joined by council member Nevin. Any more questions? Okay, then you are. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, members of the public who wish to testify? 
Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on LU512. We will now hold a vote to approve both of these items. Councilmember Johnson and Councilmember Lansman both supported his approval. Uh, the chair also supported the approval. I now call on the vote to approve LU512 and LU831. Council, please call the vote. Chair Ku. I will aye. Councilmember Palmer. Aye. Councilmember Levin. Vote aye. Councilmember Rose. I vote aye. Councilmember Barron. Permission to explain my vote? Thank you. I vote aye on 831, and I'm abstaining on 512. I think we don't have enough information as to what perhaps the financials are in this long-term lease, and we can't make an assessment as to whether or not we are getting uh, a fair shake in this deal without having the information as to the financials that are here. We don't want to wind up. We're in a situation such as what we have with the stadiums, where um, they're getting all kinds of advantages through the pilots, payment in lieu of taxes. So I'm abstaining on that. Councilmember Kalos. Aye. Land use item 831 is approved by six votes in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. And land use item 512 is approved by a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and one abstention. So we will leave the vote open for another 15 minutes. Uh, I would like to thank all the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and then you staff for attending to this meeting.